Hey, Rob, we have an AP Computer Science exam to get ready for. Well, are we in the right place then? Because this is the 2022 edition of AP Daily Live for AP Computer Science A. So welcome. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad we're both here, Tim. Um, my name is Rob Schultz, and I teach at Bellbrook High School in Bellbrook, Ohio. And I'm Tim Gallagher, and I teach at Winter Springs High School in Orlando, Florida. And we are both thrilled to be here with you, but we are even more excited that you are here with us. Um, we have put together a series of sessions that we're going to be uh, sharing with you over the next two weeks, every Monday through Thursday. And um, our goal is to spend some time doing some review of AP concepts. We're going to look at some multiple choice questions. We're going to look at free response questions, because by the time we get done, our overall goal is to make sure that you end up feeling more comfortable, more relaxed, and better prepared for the upcoming AP Computer Science A exam. So grab a couple of pencils and a pad of paper, and uh, we've got about 45 minutes together today, roughly, and so I feel like, unless I'm forgetting something, Tim, we need to just go ahead and jump in with both feet. Let's get started, Rob. Okay, so let's talk about what we're going to learn today. Okay, so first thing we're going to do we're going to talk about today's bit of the day. Tim is going to spend a little bit of time just sharing some details with you about the 2022 exam. And this will pretty much be the format for e uh, for every day as we as we work through the next two weeks. We'll start each day with a bit of the day, which will give you a little bit of um, yeah, some, some just important details about certain things. Um, after Tim shares the bit of the day for today, I'm going to go through some review of classes and class, class methods. Um, Tim will pick up at that point and we'll review a couple of multiple choice questions, and then I'll kind of round out our time together today. Uh, we'll take a look at the 2021 word match question, um, the free response question from last year's exam. So, all right. Hey, Rob, who's the duck at the bottom of the screen? Oh, I forgot. I need to introduce our duck, Maggie. Um, I'm sure some of you probably are familiar with rubber duck programming. So we have a duck as our mascot. And Maggie's been with us for a couple of years now. So so we're happy to have Maggie along. Um, I'm glad you, you reminded me to introduce her, Tim. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to you, Tim. I'm going to go ahead and stop the share so that you can pick it up from there. All right. And here we go. So this is today's bit of the day. And it's again, as Rob was mentioning, just something that will give us a little information each day as we prepare for the exam, just to make sure there's no surprises when you walk in there. And today's bit of the day is, is the format of the exam. So as you may be familiar with already, the exam consists of two parts. There's a multiple choice part, which is 40 questions. You'll have 90 minutes for that, which averages to about two minutes per question. Um, it's one point per question, and there's no penalty for guessing. So make sure that you fill in every bubble. And for the free response question, uh, there are four questions. You have 90 minutes for those, so about 22 and a half minutes per question. And each question is graded on a nine point scale. So for the free response questions, we'll get into this throughout the entire next two weeks. But there are four types of questions. As you can see, it's the method and control structures question, uh, the class implementation. We have an array, array list question, and also a 2D array. Um, these four topics are always consistent on the AP exam right now. Most of the questions involve writing two methods of a class or, or maybe separate classes, except for question two, which always involves implementing an entire class. And again, remember you have 90 minutes, so about 22 and a half minutes uh, per free response question. Also a little bit about the grading scale, uh, the way these are graded, the multiple choice and the free response sections both have equal weight. So 50% each, and you think, well, there's 40 questions for the multiple choice and then 36 points for the free response. So there's a multiplication factor to help balance those two out there. And the last thing I wanna talk about here for the format is our free response answer booklet. And this is going to be where you're gonna be answering all of your free response questions. We're going to, uh, you'll see that the, the free response questions are in a separate book, but all your answers will go on pages that look like this. There's bubbles at the top for questions one, two, three, and four. You bubble in or fill in the circle for the, for the question that you're writing. And got to make sure that you put all of your answers in that, uh, in the answer booklet, because anything that you write on the test, you can write on the test if you're taking uh, notes or, or doing kind of a rough draft, but everything that you want graded has to be in this exam booklet. So anything that's not in the exam booklet won't be graded. And that's our bit of the day. So Rob, we'll uh, turn it back over to you for some uh, review topics. Okay. okay. All right, let me find my share. And there we go. 
Okay, so let's do some review. Okay, what I wanted to review today was classes and class methods. Okay, so I came up with a really, really simple demo class. This is a circle class. We've got one private instance variable. Um, and notice that th the variable is specifically marked as private as far as its visibility modifier. Um, we, uh, within the AP framework, there will never be a time to have an instance variable that is public. Uh, so we always want to. We always want to protect our data and make sure our data stays private. The other thing I wanted to point out is that our instance variable has a scope that covers the entire class. So we have to be careful about redefining the same variable that we want to use inside any of the methods, because then we can cause some issues. So if I'm referencing the radius of this circle, keep in mind that once you declare it as an instance variable, you have access to it everywhere within the class. OK, um, the other thing I wanted to take a look at is the constructor. Now. I specifically added uh, some formatting in here because this is pretty similar to some of the things that you'll see on the actual free response questions. For In this case, we have a, a, a constructor circle that takes a double parameter R, um, but we're told that the implementation is not shown. And the reason for that is because we want to demonstrate that there's a constructor there. The fact that the implementation is, is not shown doesn't mean that we need to implement it as part of the solution, but it just means that we have a constructor, the constructor works the way it's supposed to, and we really don't have to worry about what the implementation looks like. Okay. Um, I also wanted to do a little bit of quick review of method signatures. Okay, I, I, um, I, I start, when I teach my students about method signatures, I start with the visibility modifier, okay? So notice all of our methods are public, even though the instance variable is private, we wanna make sure that our methods are available to anything outside of this class that would need access to them. Um, it is possible to make a method private, but in this case, there isn't a need to do that. So all of our methods will be public. Um, we have our return type, and we're going to talk in just a second about the difference between a void return type and an actual double or int or something like that, you know, a return type where we return a value. Um, we have the name, and the name is pretty self-explanatory. Every method has to have a name. And then finally, we've got our parameter list, and the parameter list uh, is included within the parentheses, even, the, even though in these methods I don't have any parameters, I still have to include the parentheses to show that the parameter list is empty. But in the event that I do add a parameter, that would be something that I'm throwing in that the method needs to be able to do its job. For example, adjust size needs a factor so that I know how much I'm adjusting the size by. So those are the four parts for our method signature. Okay, let's focus on the void method for just a second. Um, so our void method um, does not return a value. So anytime I use void as a return type, that simply means that I'm, I'm basically giving it an instruction. I'm telling it to do something. I'm telling my circle object that I've, I've instantiated to adjust its size by whatever factor I've passed in. So there's nothing I'm going to wait for a response back. I'm not going to ask it to return anything to me. I'm just telling it to, to carry out this, this action, whatever it is. Um, and then we have to return methods. And by return method, I mean they have to include a return because I've identified a specific return type. So in this case, these methods do return a value. Okay, um, we've got our get diameter method that simply returns the diameter, um, return two times radius. And then we also have this method down here called get circumference. And I also wanted to include a little note about, um, you know, to be implemented in part A, because again, that's pretty common to see in free response questions. We're going to be asked to implement this in part A. So this is a little different than what we saw with our constructor up here. Um, if it says implementation is not shown, we don't need to worry about it. We don't need to go back and write our constructor. But this is telling us that for part A of, of our free response question, if this were to be part of a free response question, our job as programmers would be to write the code to implement get circumference. OK, um, so let's take a second and let's look at what get circumference might look like when we do actually implement it. If we were to implement a solution, we know that circumference is two times uh, two times radius times pi. Well, the other thing I wanted to point out um, in free response questions, it's also fairly common um, to see a method that you look at it and you go, well, that doesn't really look like it's part of my solution. Well, there isn't going to be anything thrown in to be extra. OK, so if it's there, it's kind of a red flag that you're probably going to be expected to or, or be asked to use it somewhere else. And if you notice, we've got two times radius in our get circumference method. But we've also got this method up here that's already been set for us to return the, the diameter, which is two times radius. So that's a pretty good indication that we're expected to use get diameter somewhere as opposed to kind of reinventing the wheel and, and including that code a second time. So, so ideally, the solution would probably look more like this. I'm going to call the get diameter method and then multiply that by pi 
as my solution. So that is our very quick review. I feel like I'm talking very quickly, but you'll be able to go back and pause and go back and do things. Um, but that's our quick review of, of classes and class methods, OK? Um, hopefully, everybody's good to go. This is the point in class where I would say, anybody have any questions? But unfortunately, that doesn't quite work in this environment. So, Well, well I've got a question, Rob. Yes, Tim. Do you know do you know why your your constructors are so mad at each other? I don't. It's because they have so many arguments. <laughs> nice. I like that one. Very good. Go. <laughs> and there's more where that came from if you tune in every day between now and next Thursday. I, I feel like we need a rim shot or uh, right. you know, I've got I've got oh, my what? duck this call. The, there's the quack. There it yeah, is. There we go. There we go. All right. Nice. Okay, so I'm going to pass the baton back over to you, Tim, uh, so that we can do some practice. All right. So one thing that we want to do in these videos as well is give you a chance to answer some multiple choice questions similar to what you might see on the AP exam. And then not just answer those questions, but then also we'll take some time to trace through these questions with you so that you understand uh, why the answer is what it is. And if you answer something else, maybe why that answer wouldn't be correct. So uh, let's go ahead and practice here. So the first one, uh, we have a, a question that says, the following code segment is supposed to print exam time if the string variable today contains Wednesday and the string variable time contains 12 p.m. And Rob, did you know that the AP exam is on May the 4th this year? It's on Star Wars Day. I did know that. I, I noticed that as I was looking at the schedule and putting it on the board for my own students. I thought that was fantastic. So it's uh, so may the 4th be with you. And, uh, and and it's also on a Wednesday at 12 o'clock. So here's our here's our code segment. It says we have a missing conditional statement that is going to print out exam time. And the question is, which of the following could replace missing conditional statements so that the code segment works as intended? So what we can do here with this video is if you can go ahead and hit the pause button on your video and we'll give you a second to look over these and uh, and answer them. So go ahead and hit the pause button on the video and we'll come back and we'll go over the answer here in just a brief moment. And I hope you hit pause and I hope you got an answer and we're back. So let's go over this one right now. So what's going on here? Well, we've got three different options that we could replace our missing conditional statement, right? So the first one says if today dot equals Wednesday and time dot equals 12 p.m. So this is we're using the dot equals method of the string class and we're using the double ampersand, the and sign to say that uh, to check to see if today equals Wednesday and if it equals 12 p.m. Is that what we want to have happen? Well, it is because both of them have to be true. So in this case, because we have the ampersand, both of these conditions have to be true in order for it to print out exam time. So option one is a good option. So that one works. What about the second one? Well, the second one uses an or symbol. If today dot equals Wednesday or time dot equals 12 p.m. This will work if they're both Wednesday and 12 p.m., but it won't work only if they're both Wednesday and 12 p.m. If it said Thursday and 12 p.m., or if it said Wednesday at 8 a.m., it would print out exam time. And that's not what we want to have happen. So this one does not work. Uh, option two is not a valid uh, solution so that it works as intended. And then the last one is two if statements, right? It's an if inside of an if, nested if statements. So if today dot equals Wednesday, and then another if statement, if time dot equals 12 p.m. Well, the only way for us to then get to the print statement would be if both of those evaluate to true and then it would print out exam time. So that works as well. So which ones work? Options one and three. So that means our answer is gonna be D. How'd you do? Hopefully you did pretty well. All right, let's try one more multiple choice practice here. And here's another one. Now this one, um, as we go on, we'll be doing all different types of multiple choice. We'll be looking at completing code like we just did, or here this type of uh, multiple choice uh, practices on the skill of what does this print out or what does this display or what is the outcome of the code here. And as we do different multiple choice questions over the next two weeks, uh, you'll see us practicing different skills as well within these questions. So this one says, consider the following code segment. And it looks like we have a for loop and an if statement. So some of the basics of Java uh, in our first video here. And it says, what is going to be printed as a result of executing this code segment? So 
again, let's go ahead and hit the pause button. Take a moment or two and, and see if you can trace through the loop and, and see when would that if statement uh, execute to true. And as a result, what would this print out? So go ahead and hit pause and we'll come back in just a moment and see how you did. And we're done. That was quick. So, so let's look at what we have here. So I've got a for loop, right? And this for loop says from x equals zero, uh, while x is less than 15. And then notice the x plus equals two. So this is not just a very common loop where it counts by ones, we're counting by twos. So let's think about what are all the values of x going to be? And this would be a good way to to try to start determining what the answer might be. So I know my x values are gonna be 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, all my even numbers between zero up to 15. So we're gonna stop at 14. So right off the bat, because I know my values of x are gonna be 0, 2, 4, and I'm only printing out values of x, I know that a can't be a possibility because that has a three and a nine. And I know d can't be a possibility because that has a, a whole bunch of numbers in there that aren't going to be considered. And I know that E can't be a possibility either. So just by knowing how my loop is going to go and the fact that I'm only printing X values, I'm not printing X plus one or anything like that, I know that A, D, and E can be eliminated right off the bat. Now let's look at our if statement. Our if statement says if X mod three equals zero. So what does this mean, right? Mod is when, when I divide by three, what's my remainder going to be? So in this case, where am I going to get a remainder of zero every time I divide by three, which of these numbers are multiples of three. So if we look through our values of X that are multiples of three, we're going to get zero and six and 12. And those are the only ones that are gonna print out. So as a result, it can't be C because C has some other numbers like four and eight that are not valid. So process of elimination and also by tracing through the code, our answer has to be B, zero, six and 12. And there we go. And that's the type of things we'll be doing with multiple choice questions, tracing through them with you. And if you take some time to answer them on your own, and then hopefully you can uh, spend some time with us to, uh, to go over them with them afterwards and see how you did. Hopefully you did pretty well. Great job, right. everybody. Excellent. So here, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to Rob, who is going to uh, look at our free response question. Okay, let's see, there we go. Okay, I got it. Okay, so let's look at an example free response question. Now, Tim, I got a question for you. Have you sure. ever wished that you had some program that would let you store a word, for example, maybe a secret word, and then go through and compare and, and, and just figure out some things having to do with like smaller words inside that word? I, Wouldn't I that be just, cool? I was just wondering, you know, why hasn't someone made an app for that already? Well, today's our lucky day because we're looking at the 2021 free response question word match, which happens to involve storing a secret string and then providing some methods that would compare other strings to our secret string, okay? It's like it was planned. I know, it was almost like we thought of this ahead of time. So here's what you're gonna do for this problem. We're being asked to write two methods in this word match class that we're given off to the side, okay? so. This question involves having a secret string and kind of like the example I went through a little bit ago, we've got our private instance variable that is a, a string and it's called secret. Um, we have a constructor and again, it's showing us that our implementation isn't shown. So we don't really care how our constructor works. We just know that at some point we pass it a word and it uses it to set our secret, our, our secret string. We have two return methods. Both are gonna be implemented in different parts of the question. So we have an int method and a string method. The one thing I didn't really mention when we did the review is preconditions, okay? So preconditions are things that are assumed to be true that we don't have to worry about within the method that we're writing, okay? So for example, in part A, it's telling us that our guess, our parameter guess, has a length that's between zero and the length of our secret string. So that isn't something we need to check for. In fact, it's recommended that you do not write checks for the preconditions into your code. And we'll talk a little bit more about why you wouldn't wanna write preconditions tomorrow in our, in our bit of the day. But that's not anything we have to spend time working on because it's given to us that that's gonna be true before we even start, okay? So we don't have to worry about writing code for preconditions. Okay, so let's let's look specifically at part A. For part A, it says we're going to write the method score guess, and it says to determine the score to be returned, our method score guess is going to find the number of times that guess our parameter. Here we go, our parameter that we're passing into this method 
we're going to find the number of times that our guess occurs as a substring of secret, our secret word. And then we're going to take that number, the number of occurrences, and multiply it by the square of the length of guess. And it tells us occurrences of guess may overlap within secret. Now, I'm going to kind of hesitate for just a minute before we go on to talk more about the question, because one thing I want to point out, you're going to be given examples for your free response questions. And it's really important to understand that you aren't writing a specific method that specifically deals with only those examples, right? These are just examples. Our secret word could be anything and the guess could be anything. And we need to write our code so that it will take any secret word and any guess. These are just two examples of things that you could use to test your code to make sure it works, but they are not the only things that could be thrown into those methods. Okay. So now that we've got that out of the way, the question goes on and it kind of reiterates our preconditions. Again, it tells us that the length of guess is less than or equal to the length of secret and that guess is not an empty string. So there has to be something in guess, but it's not going to be any longer than our secret word. Okay, and then we've got our two examples. So the following examples show declarations of word match. And so I, I want to kind of work through just one of the examples. There are several different examples here we could choose from. Um, I've never been to Mississippi. I would love to go to Mississippi. I just like to say Mississippi. So we're going to use the Mississippi example. Okay, so to start, we instantiate a word match object called game. And we pass in Mississippi that is going to become our secret word. So there is our secret word with all of the index positions of each letter below it. OK, now we could really test with any of these guesses, but for the sake of having a specific example to work off of, I chose ISS. So we're going to look at ISS and see what the return score would be for for ISS as our value. So as we think about this, the first thing we need to do is it says we need to count the number of occurrences. So we need a counter. All right, so there's our counter. We've got a variable that we're going to call count and we're going to set it equal to zero. And then we need to traverse our string from the start to the end and we need to count the number of occurrences of ISS as we go. So we're going to start at position zero and we're going to look at substrings that have a length of three because our guess has a length of three. So MIS is not a match. So we're going to iterate through as we continue to traverse our string. But now look, we've got ISS, which is a match for our guess. So we increment our counter by one. And as we continue to traverse through, as we continue to move from left to right in our string, we get SSI, we get SIS, we get ISS again. So there's a second occurrence. So we increment our counter again. We continue to work our way across just to make sure we haven't missed any SSI, SIP, IPP, PPI. And this is where we have to be really careful because it's, it's pretty standard for us to go from zero up to the length of our string that we're traversing, but we can't necessarily do that in, in this case because if we go even one further from where we are right now, well, now we're trying to reference a character of our string that doesn't exist, which means we've just thrown an index out of bounds exception and we definitely don't want that, okay? So we have to make, make sure as we traverse our string that we stop earlier than we would need to, or I guess at the point we would need to, to make sure we're only looking at substrings that are the length of our actual string. If we were doing this other guess, we would have to stop six before the end. If we were doing Mississippi itself, we would have to basically stop at the beginning. We just need to make sure we're keeping track of how long our guess is so that we don't go beyond and go out of bounds, okay? So now that we found our count, okay, now is where we go through and calculate our score. So the instruction said we take our count, and we multiply that by the length of our guess. Well, our guess has a length of three, which means we're going to multiply it by, sorry, we're going to multiply it by the length of our guess squared. So we're going to end up with two times three times three. Three times three is our, our, the length of our guess squared. And we're going to get a return score of 18. So when we call score guess with ISS as the parameter, uh, or I should say as the argument, we're going to get 18 as our return score. OK, so here's what, I, here's what I'd like you to do. OK, Maggie is back and Maggie's kind of got the idea that we probably need to take some time and work through this. So I'd like you to pause. OK, in a second, I'm going to ask you to pause and I want you to take as much time as you need. Five minutes, 10 minutes. If you need a little longer than that, that's fine, too. See if you can flesh out a really solid, uh, a really solid solution to part A of this problem. And then when you're ready, press play, as you've done for the past couple multiple choice. And we'll go back and we'll take some time and we'll review and go through a solution. OK, so go ahead and press pause and then press play when you're ready to, to look at solutions. OK, we're back. So hopefully everybody had some time to really think about how this is going to work and all of the pieces that are needed to put this solution together. OK, um, so 
the first thing I probably need to point out as we look at solutions is this is not the solution that I'm going to show you is not the one and only solution. My students, when we start looking at free response questions in my own class, seem to think that the solution I show on the board is the only solution that's going to get points. And there are a lot of different ways that you could answer this question and get full credit. So as long as your solution meets the requirements of the question and it works with all of the examples and it works with anything else that could be thrown in there, you will get full credit, even if your solution is slightly different than the solution that, that I'm going to show you, which happens to be the, the solution that's listed with the scoring guidelines on College Board's website. OK, so for the solution, you're going to be given uh, we're, we're given the the method header. All right. So really what we need to do is we need to think about what would we do first? Well, we said we have to traverse our secret string, um, but we have to make sure we stop in time so that we don't go out of bounds. So we're going to start with a for loop and we want to start at position zero, but we want to make sure we stop at the correct time. So we're going to take the length of our secret word, whatever that happens to be, and subtract whatever the length of our guess is. In our case of our example, Mississippi has um, 11 characters going from 0 to 10, and our guess has a length of 3. So if I take the length 11 and I subtract 3, we're going to end up stopping at position 8, which makes sure we don't go out of bounds so we've protected ourselves. Okay. The second thing we need to do is once we get to the point that we start traversing our string, we need to compare substrings. So whatever our index position is from I, we're going to take a substring from that position up to the value of the index of I plus the length of our guess. So when I equals zero, our guess had a length of three for our example, which means we're going to look at a substring from zero to three. And then the next time through the loop, we'll look at one to four and then two to five and so on. So that we're always comparing substrings that have a length three to our guess. And if by some chance the substring we're looking at is equal to our guess, then we increment our counter. Now, there's one thing missing, and this is a common thing to miss because it's really easy to get involved in the algorithm and think, OK, I've got to increment a counter. But it's easy to forget that we need to initialize, uh, that we need to declare and, and initialize a counter. So by adding this variable, it's kind of a red flag. It's a reminder that we need to go back and say, OK, we have to declare and initialize a counter so that we have something to add to. All right. And then finally, our method header says we have an int return type, which means we need to include a return statement. We're expected to return an integer value back. And remember, our formula was that we that we return the count times guess.length times guess.length. You know, we want the length of our guess squared. So here's our return statement. We're going to return our count multiplied by the length of our guess times the length of our guess. And I did want to throw in one alternate solution okay or one alternate piece to the solution because again there are a lot of ways you could do this um, i know that part of the methods and control structures part of the course involves using the math class and one of the math methods gives us the ability to find a power so it would be just as acceptable for your return statement to say return count times math.pal guess.length comma two remember math.pal finds a power so we would be raising the length of our guess to the second power we would be multiplying that by count so both of these would do essentially the same thing, and either one of them would be considered a, a perfectly valid solution. Okay, so hopefully everybody did great on part A. Um, if if you have any questions about part A, make sure that that you go back and do a little bit of review. Maybe even plug this in and try and try and write a little test for it on your own to see if you can make it work in a compiler. Okay, but we need to move on. Let's let's check out part B. OK, so part B says we're going to write the find better guess method of word match, which is going to take two guesses. So notice an example like here, we've got 10 and nation. So we're going to pass in two strings. And then it tells us if the score guess method returns different values for our two guesses, then we're going to return whichever guess has the higher value. All right. And if by some chance we call, we call score guess on our, our two guesses and they return the same value, then we're going to return whichever guess is alphabetically greater. OK, so what does alphabetically greater mean? OK, so alphabetically greater simply means that if you're looking up the words in a dictionary, the alphabetically greater word comes later. It's whichever word comes alphabetically after the other. OK, so that's what we mean by alphabetically greater. So let's look at a quick example, OK, before we get in um, before we get into our code. Um, we've got a couple examples we can work from this. In this case, we're going to use the word concatenation as our secret word. And so we're going to call find better guess and we're going to pass in the guesses 10 and nation to see which one would be a better guess. 
So remember in the review, I said that it's not uncommon to go back and use other parts of our code. Well, in, in this case, we're being told we have to use the score guess method that we wrote for part A. We can assume even if we feel like we made a mistake in part A, we don't need to go back and rewrite any of score guess into this solution. We can assume it works correctly for the purposes of part B. So find a better guess is going to call the score guess method with each of our guesses. In this case, score guess 10 is going to return a value of 9, and score guess nation is going to return a value of 36. And because score guess nation has the higher value, find a better guess is going to return the string nation. OK, for our second example, we're going to pass in con and cat. OK, now in this case, if I call score guess with con, I get a return value of nine. And if I call score guess with cat, I also get a value of nine. So because those are equal, we're going to look at these two words and determine which one is alphabetically greater. In this case, it's going to be con because con comes after cat in the dictionary. And we're going to return the word con. Okay, that's our guess that has the, the higher value or it's alphabetically after. Okay, so let's go through. Um, Maggie's back again. Maggie's telling us that it's time to pause one last time before we bring things to a close today. Pause for, again, for five to 10 minutes, whatever time you need to feel like you can find a, a good solution to this problem. And when you're ready to go through the results, press play and we'll go back and we'll do some review. And we're back. OK, so let's talk about our solution. So we've got our find better guess method header um, with our string return type. So the first thing it said we need to do is we need to return the guess of which whichever guess has the higher score value. So um, first thing we're going to do is let's check and see if guess one has a higher score guess than guess two. If statement that that you know we've already kind of reviewed in our multiple choice questions with Tim, if score guess of guess one has a higher value than score guess of guess two, automatically we return guess one. And remember, a return means that's the end of the method. As soon as we return something, the method ends, we don't look at any code below it. So that would, that would be a perfectly good solution in the event that guess one has a higher value than guess two. If guess one does not have a higher value than guess two, uh, then we need to go on and we need to check because there are a couple of other possibilities. Well, the other thing we need to check is we need to say, OK, does that mean that guess two has a higher score than guess one. And if that's the case, we need to return guess two. So there's really only one other possibility. Either guess one is greater than guess two, or guess two is greater than guess one. And if neither of those is true, then they have to be equal to each other. And because they're equal, that's the only other possibility. We don't really even need to check for it. If this is false and this is false, they have to be equal, which means really the only thing we need to check for at this point is if we get to this point, which one is alphabetically greater than the other? And we do that using compare to. Okay, compare to is our string method that tells us what the relationship is between two strings with an integer value. So in this case, if guess one dot compare to guess two returns an integer value greater than zero, it means that guess one comes alphabetically after guess two. So we would return guess one. The alternative to this is if this is false, that means that guess two has to come alphabetically after. But again, because there are only two choices, we really don't need another condition. If we get all the way through this and we haven't returned anything yet, the only possible outcome, the only other possible solution is that guess two is the one that needs to be returned. So really, all we have to do at that point is say, return guess two. If we haven't returned here, if we haven't returned here, if we haven't returned here, guess two is the only other choice. So that's the one that goes. So how'd everybody do? Everybody feeling pretty good about it? I feel Tim, great about it, Rob. I feel great. Good, Tim? I, did, I did fantastic on that one. Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. All right. So um, I'm going to turn things back over to you for the takeaway. And then we are done for the day. All right. So here we go with what should we take away? So and there's a lot of files falling into that folder right there for what we should take away. A lot of information today. So as you recall, we started off with the bit of the day and gave us a little information about the 2022 exam, uh, what parts there are, and a little bit about how it scored. And then we, uh, Rob reviewed the uh, the classes and the class methods, kind of a basic structure of, of how a class is put together, went over some multiple choice questions for the review, and then we finished up, Rob did the word match, uh, the 2021 free response question, a uh, word match. And let's talk a little bit 
about tomorrow's video. We hope you can tune in tomorrow because tomorrow we'll be talking our bit of the day uh, will be our free response question scoring guidelines. So we'll talk about how some of these free, uh, free response questions are scored and, and some things uh, that are not scored on there as well. Uh, we're going to talk about the relationships between classes and objects. We looked at how a class is structured. Tomorrow we're going to put that together with classes and objects and calling methods. We'll also do another multiple choice question review. And then our free response question, again, is going to be another question from the 2021 exam. So we're going to make sure we hit all of the last year's questions. We're going to talk about the combined table free response question, and that'll be on tomorrow's exam. And Rob, I think that does it for our first video. I think that's it. I think we've got this one in the books. Fantastic. You all, thank you so much for joining us here on AP Daily Live 2022. We hope you got a lot out of it. And Rob, I hope we see everybody back again tomorrow. Same time. For me too. Yep. Same time tomorrow. Everybody have a great day, the great, uh, a great rest of your day, and we'll see you back here same time tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Take care.